everyone! A couple weeks ago, I showed you Tesla Software Version 9 in a Hardware 1 Model S. This week, let's take a look at Software Version 9 in a Model 3. Software Version 9 in the Model 3 comes with a ton of changes, but on the surface, it looks pretty familiar. So the changes that should jump out at you pretty much immediately on the main screen here, navigation has been moved to the left side, whereas previously it was way over here on the right. Um, this is much more convenient when driving, and I'll talk more about that later. Icons have been moved around and added to the bottom bar here. So the elements at the top have been moved around as well. So time and temperature are now on the left side. We have our new dash cam icon right there. And things that you don't access very frequently when you're actually operating the vehicle, like profiles or the Bluetooth settings and stuff, those have been pushed off to the right side. Beyond UI changes and feature additions, Software Version 9 also came with a significant update to Autopilot which I'll talk about first because YouTube comments. One of the most visible changes to Autopilot in V9 is that the car now displays vehicles all around itself while you're driving rather than only picking up a few vehicles in front of you. As you can see in this example, which was from when I was driving on surface streets, the car displays vehicles both to the left, to the right, in front, and even the vehicle directly behind, assuming that it's close enough. When you're at a stop, like right here, uh, the cars can jitter around a bit, so this is clearly a work in progress, uh, but it is progress nonetheless. On the highway, at least in the testing that I've done so far, Autopilot performed well. It didn't dive for any exits while in the right lane. However, it was confused by on-ramps merging in on the right. So, as you can see in this example, the right line kind of, it, it detects it as bowing outward, but really that's just the, the on-ramp merging in. Um, and so the car then shifts to the right, trying to center itself in this new larger space, and then will eventually drift back to center as the lane shrinks down again. But it's, it's not a very comforting thing as the driver for the car to do that, especially since the car was making the shift to the right a little abruptly, which just ends up causing a whole bunch of disengagements. Also, I'm sure the people behind you probably think you're drunk. Unnecessary autopilot nags were minimal. I think I only experienced three in my 60 mile test trip. Uh, but as you guys know, I tend to operate autopilot with my hands on the wheel, but I will balance force between the two sides of the wheel, which will sometimes make, make the car think that I'm not holding the wheel. So, you know, to only get three nags in 60 miles is not too terrible. One of the features that was significantly improved with the version 9 release that I'm running right now was auto lane change. With prior software versions in this car, lane change took a really long time. So you would signal, it would sit there and wait and wait and wait, and then very slowly slide over to the next lane. But the wait once the turn signal is engaged in this version of Software 9 is reasonably short, and more importantly, the transition from one lane to the next is carried out much more quickly and much more naturally. Also, it shuts off the turn signal for you once it's done. Tesla also added some blind spot warning improvements with this release by turning lane lines red if you engage the turn signal with a car or an object next to you. Some people may find this helpful, but I think that waiting until you've already engaged the turn signal to provide any feedback to the driver is a little late. Generally speaking, if you want to pre-plan your maneuvers while driving, you've already checked your mirrors and already checked over your shoulder before engaging the turn signal. Moreover, to reiterate past criticisms about the way Tesla approaches blind spot monitoring, the screens, whether it be behind your steering wheel or in your center dash, are not where you're looking when you're changing lanes. You're checking mirrors, you're checking over your shoulder, you're not looking at screens. This is why most manufacturers will put their blind spot warning system either in the A pillars or in the mirror glass itself. Anyway, that's enough autopilot stuff for now. I'll probably go more in depth once the drive on nav feature is finally released and perhaps do a comparison with hardware one. So let's get back to the fun part, me talking about user interface. Probably the most significant change in the Model 3 UI was the addition of apps that people have been asking for for a while. Just like with the Model S, we have this little apps dock icon here we can press, which brings up all the new apps. So, like with the Model S, you now have the calendar, which will sync to your phone if you have a phone connected to the car, which I don't at the moment. You also have your energy app. This works the exact same way that it does in the Model S and X. So right now this is set for 30 miles worth of information. So you get the last 30 miles on there, projected range, the efficiency over the last 30 miles, which is 214 watt hours per mile, which is very impressive. And then you also have the trip section, which would display your trip energy here, just like it would in the Model S or X if you had a trip set in nav. Web browser has finally been added to the Model 3, and unlike in my old Tegra 3 powered Model S's MCU, uh, this actually works pretty well in the Model 3. So scrolling through sites is fairly smooth. 
uh, loading sites is reasonably quick and I'm on Wi-Fi right now and you can go to uh, the Tesla site the site loads up pretty quickly you can scroll through the site which if you remember from last week's video this was kind of just doing this was sort of a mess uh, so this actually works now which is nice a couple of the icons in the app tray are redundant like the camera icon which it just pulls up your camera but you can also just do that right here uh, and the charging icon is again that's redundant because you can do that right here but if you already have the apps dock pulled up then well it, it does save you a tap for dismissing the apps dock and then and then poking it here one of the things i forgot to mention in the version 9 video that i shot for my model s is that you can swipe up on this app dock icon to bring up the app you last used so if you have the music app open like this you can swipe up on the app icon and get you know your energy app or whatever you had up last. One of the things that I forgot to mention in that Model S version 9 video is that you can, in the Model S and X, have uh, two apps up in addition to Navs. You can have Nav, Music, and one other app up. If you kind of do this weird swipey thing in two spots at once and you drag up the Music app while dragging up uh, your previously used app from the app tray, and it, if you get it just right, they'll stick. If you don't, they kind of collapse back down again. And it's, it's something that seems more like a bug to me than a feature. Similarly, you can try that in the Model 3, but nothing really sticks. You can see I've got, there we go, I'll get the, there, and, and, oh, nope, that one went away. Let's, let's, let's try that again. Can I get, nope, how will we just, Oh, well, see, now it's on top. Oh, hey, they stuck that time. Okay, so it did stick. You can, you can just see music back there, but you can't interact with it. And if you try to use a shorter app, like, say, camera, we may be able to get... Oh, now we've got three up. You've got camera up, and you can see that there's the <laughs> energy consumption app back there. And then that little sliver there uh, is, is music. I'm sure if I fiddle with this long enough, I can probably set some record for most apps open at once on a Tesla. Moving right along, heated seat controls are the familiar three bacon, two bacon, one bacon, no bacon variety. The HVAC controls, similar to the S, have been completely reworked. So by tapping the fan button, it turns everything on and pulls up the new interface. Uh, although you can now shut it off by tapping and holding on the fan button. The same applies to the Model S. So I, I did make a mistake there in my Model S video. Temperature can be adjusted by tapping left or tapping right near the, uh, the temperature readout. And you can also now slide your finger left and right to adjust temperature. Normally, I'd be against this kind of gesture to control temperature. Um, however, they've made the gain on it low enough to where you can make fairly fine adjustments even while you're bouncing around. So, you know, had the gain been turned up a lot and you only had to move, like, say, this much to swing from the left to the right side of the scale, that would have been ridiculous. But they've got the gain set to where, you know, you gotta, you gotta go pretty far uh, to be able to exercise the full scale. And that's... That's actually a good choice. I still prefer tap controls, but the low gain on the swipe gesture makes it very functional. Also got this reworked vent control display. You've got the virtual representation of the dash and then these, these squiggles coming out indicating where the air is flowing, uh, whereas previously you just had dots. Um, and this automatically converges as you approach center and then diverges as you move away from the center point. And you can see that represented here, here, and here. Let me just pull that up again. Um, kind of gives you an XY indication of what's happening. Is it a functional improvement? I haven't really decided yet, but it does look cool. Grayed out on the sides here because I'm in auto right now or the rest of the HVAC controls. You can turn on recirc here like that. Uh, this button right here forces the rear vent to turn on. So when you press this button and you reach back here, you should, yep, feel an air blowing out of there now. Because uh, normally that only turns on if someone's sitting in the back seat. You can also adjust the fan manually right here. Uh, the swipe does not work on it. You have to use tap only. So, you know, there's a bit of a change in the UI there. Uh, go back to auto. If you need to turn on your rear seat heaters, they're right here. You can turn them on and adjust the bacon. You get one bacon, you get two bacon, you get three bacon. And you can turn them all off. One of the apps that received a huge and very welcome update was the media app. So we have more useful recents and favorites. There's finally a shuffle option, which we didn't have before. Going to full screen, they've changed the way you interface with the, uh, the USB portion of this. So go to USB device. We now have a nice big list of tracks to choose from rather than these little bubbles where you'd previously pick, you know, songs, artists, albums, genre, folders, whatever. Those are now a bar on the left. And so we can just go through that. And the list portion here is nice and big and easy to read. Uh, the alphabetical quick jump here is now taking up pretty much the whole the uh, whole side of the menu. 
So you know you want to you want to jump around. You can. It's much easier now. So they have hugely improved. Uh, at the very least, the USB end of the multimedia app. One of my criticisms from the Model S still holds true here. I do prefer my index taps as opposed to swipes. Um, and as you can see, you know, the, the tap will just bring up whatever the previous state was for the multimedia app. And you either have to drag it here like that, which is not very precise, or you have to do little flicks from here to give the different sizes, or you can just drag it up and down from the music app icon. Again, resizing the app with swipes and drags and stuff is just a lot more finicky than index taps. You guys probably know by now that I really hate nested menus in car UIs. And this is something that Tesla improved on with version 9 in the Model 3. We'll go ahead and open vehicle controls here and you'll see your usual quick controls. But as I jump through these, you might notice that something is missing. That something is the gear icon button in the top right which is where Tesla was burying more menu options and leaving a bunch of space open here. That nesting was completely unnecessary and ridiculous. Thankfully, Tesla has remedied that by just unpacking it. I mean, you do have to scroll now, which you didn't have to scroll previously, as I recall, but you aren't having to access a separate menu to get to options. This is definitely a positive change and an improvement in overall usability, but there are still some options that remain in submenus, for example, if we go into the mirror adjustment control submenu, you'll find the mirror auto tilt and mirror auto fold. This is where they have been for a while now. In fact, I think this is where they've always been in this car, uh, but they're not replicated anywhere else. So you, you do still have to go into the mirror adjustment submenu to control those things. But overall, I'd say that this is definitely positive change. For the most part, everything in quick controls here is large and easy to interact with, especially things that you may be expected to use while driving, like say adjusting the mirrors. Um, all of the buttons involved in that are very large and easy to, uh, to identify. Moving on from quick controls to lights, you've got your lighting controls here. Uh, like I was mentioning in my Model S version 9 video, I really would like to see the interior dome light control added to quick controls, although I realize with the Model 3 there just is not nearly as much space here as there is in the Model S. The Model S had tons of space to put all sorts of things, but they didn't. There is still a submenu in the Autopilot tab for customizing Summon, and this makes sense as a submenu because there's a lot going on here and a lot to adjust, uh, and this is not something that you'll be interacting with at any point while you are driving, so that, that's okay. Some of the other options, however, it's, it's, like I said, a great thing that they pulled them out of submenus. The dash cam functionality that was introduced with version 9 is very, very limited at this point. In fact, there aren't any menus for it or anything. You basically just create a Tesla cam directory on a USB flash drive that you plug into one of the USB ports, and then you get this little icon right up here, which should have a little red dot up in the corner instead of the gray X that's in there right now. That will indicate that it's recording, and then you just tap it to save off the last 10 minutes to the flash drive. Then you can pull your flash drive out of your car, plug it into your computer, and watch the videos that it records, and it records them, if I remember correctly, in uh, 10 one-minute clips. At least in the current release, Tesla's only using the narrow field autopilot camera for the dash cam functionality, which, aside from the quality not being great, results in, again, a fairly narrow field of view. Most dash cams are really wide angle so that you can see everything out to the edges, um, that's not what this is going to give you. But it is better than nothing. As for why the camera has a little gray X in it instead of a red dot, I have no idea. I'm going to have to pull my flash drive out and troubleshoot this because it was working fine yesterday and, well, right now it's not working at all. Navigation, aside from being moved from the right side of the screen to the left side of the screen, has seen a significant update. Now it functions a little more like the binnacle display nav in the Model S. However, a decision that I don't agree with is that the estimated arrival state of charge is no longer shown in the default view on the floating nav panel. To view the estimated arrival state of charge, you now either have to tap or pull down on the floating nav panel to receive that information, and it pulls back in the process to the full trip view. I don't think that's a piece of information that should be hiding from the driver or require interaction with the screen to gain access to, especially when you can't have Nav and the Energy app up at the same time in the Model 3. It could be argued that having that information there is redundant in the Model S and X, but that's only because you can have the trip energy graph pulled up at the same time as Nav. That's not the case in the Model 3. Some may make stylistic arguments about the layout that Tesla chose for version 9 in the Model 3, but it's important to remember that functionality trumps form 
always when we're talking about touch interface in a vehicle. And while it's clear that Tesla's walking the line on this one and has been for quite some time and does occasionally trend a little too far into form rather than function, uh, there are certain things here that do have purpose. For example, the large white space in the left column, especially around these control buttons down here, part of that is there because they're actually control interface. Um, when you're working with a touch UI, you have to account for a lack of user precision. Uh, so you either have to create large bounding boxes around things or you just make the area around them responsive. So for example, with the rear camera, I'm pressing completely off to the side here and it still activates the camera. That's so that you can activate it while you're driving with low precision. This is less the case with the power control. You can see I can tap, tap here or here and it doesn't really do anything. I kind of have to get pretty close to that one, but that's not something you interact with while driving. The voice command control, similarly, you can tap pretty far away from it, like that, and it still works. Uh, ah, no, stop, go away. They do have a lot of dead space on either side of the button that brings up the wiper control card, uh, but that could be for some future functionality. And again, if, if you're trying to put things here that are meant to be interacted with while driving, they either need to be very large buttons like that, or they need to have a large interactive zone, much like the camera button does. Last but not least, Tesla did include the same classic Atari emulator with the version 9 release in the Model 3 that they did for the S and X. You access it by pressing the T button at the top of the screen and then pulling down to get the Easter egg tray and then poking Atari. So let's go ahead and play Lunar Lander. Let's go full screen. Yeah, okay, triple tap to exit full screen. Okie doke. And maybe this time I won't hose it up as bad. No, we are not going to crash into a mountain. Watch me not crash into a mountain. If I say it enough, it might happen. Oh, I'm going too fast. Going to crash into a mountain. Still too fast. Oh, that's better. Let's go up just a smidge. Set this down nice and easy. There we go. Success! Anyway, that's about it for this look at Tesla Software version 9 and a Model 3. If you have any questions or comments, leave those in the comments section down below. Don't forget to rate and subscribe, and I'll see you later.